security is a hot topic these days. It's great that we have Michal Kowalski to unveil some of the mysteries and share how you could audit your own code on a day-to-day -day basis without engaging uh, substantial monetary costs. So please take it away, Michal. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for choosing this session. Uh, today, I want to talk a little bit uh, about the audits, about the audits of your code, and mostly not about the audits as you probably think about them, but about some techniques that you could implement in your projects to improve the overall security. So to make it an, something usual, something made every day. Okay, few words about me uh, at the beginning. So uh, I'm working as a solution architect in SII Poland in Poznan branch. Uh, so I'm dealing with some Java-based application, microservices, Kafka, and stuff like that. Uh, but regardless of the role of my role in the project, uh, I'm always a developer deep inside. And also, I'm very into the, uh, the software craftsmanship approach and uh, also, mostly in my free time, I'm dealing with some uh, with some security stuff, uh, some some conferences, uh, OWASP talks, and things like that. Uh, also, I worked some time ago as a kind of security officer, and in my free time, um, I'm also writing some posts uh, on my blog. Okay, uh, just few words about my company. So about the SII. Uh, so. We are the, the leading IT and engineering uh, services provider in Poland with almost 4,000 uh, engineers right now. And uh, what is really amazing about the SII is the fact that we have lots of different projects and the projects that could be changed. So uh, if you want to change the project, you're free to go. Um, we have both the local and international clients, uh, and we are dealing with the projects uh, on at uh, 12 branches all over the Poland and also uh, we are grouping the uh, the specialists in so-called the competency centers and also um, we have a dedicated competency center for testing uh, purposes and uh, about the testing so uh, we know that testing is important we know that testing is hard and we know that testing matters so we are also a part of community uh, especially in our Poznan branch. So we are organizing some uh, or co-hosting some uh, some events and supporting some local initiatives. OK. When I first saw this image, I said to myself, I have to have it on my presentation. Why? Because it's exactly how a lot of people think about the security of the code. Because they say, ah, maybe we have some bugs. Maybe we have some vulnerabilities. But is it an issue for us? Maybe nobody know. Who wants to hack us? No, it's just working. Don't, don't touch this. It's working. But this is not the best approach. And you should probably not follow it. Why? So the ultimate question that I would like to ask right now is why should we care about the security in our projects? And the answer is pretty straightforward. Because it's all about the craftsmanship. So we are doing our best to improve the code uh, with some, some techniques, with some practices, with some tools. And we should do exactly the same with the security. This should not be any, any different uh, to this one. This is a part of our code. This is a part of our job. Our job as developers, as testers, and, and so on. So the first word in the title of my presentation is audit. The question is what the audit is. So in most cases when we are saying audit, we mean that we want to hire somebody, maybe from our uh, organization, maybe from some external authority, to verify our system, to investigate if there are some bugs, if there are some vulnerabilities, if uh, everything is configured properly, securely, and, and things like that. And the audit itself is a complicated process. I could say that it has layers. And I was thinking 
about how to visualize that. And please, uh, I want to warn you right now, uh, you will see the only drawing that I made for this presentation, the only one, sorry for that. This is probably not the worst of my drawings, but probably not one of the best ones. But it just visualizes how I think about the audits that I saw in the past. So let's meet the Audit Onion. The Audit Onion. Why the Onion? Because the Onion has layers like the Audit itself. And uh, most of the security audits look like this. We are starting from the core. We are starting from the dependencies. So we have the external libraries. We have internal libraries. We have libraries in general that we are building our code on top of. So something here could be broken. We didn't start the implementation. We just picked up the library and something could already be broken. Then we have the source code. So the source code could be broken because it's not uh, designed well, because it has some security bugs. But the source code itself is not yet the application. We have to deploy it somewhere. We have to run it somewhere. So we need an infrastructure. An infrastructure from the security perspective could also be an issue, because maybe the operating system is not up to date. Maybe we misconfigured something. It's hard to say. And then, when the code is being deployed, we have the application. And the application is the most interesting part, because now the hacking starts. Yay! We have all those hackers that are trying to convince us that we made a mistake, that something could be hacked. There are some SQL injection uh, vulnerabilities and stuff like that. But the next part is not the technical one, but it's still very important. And the good audit should also verify this. So you have the business process. And your business process could also be wrong. What does it mean? So let's imagine that you implemented the permission set. You have the checks for permission to gain access to some data. And you did your best as a developer. You did your best as a tester. And everything runs fine. There is nothing wrong in the implementation. But the business process that has been implemented is wrong itself. So it's possible that with some hacking modifications, somebody will gain access to the data that should not be visible to him. This is not the issue with the application itself, but the business, but with the business that has been implemented within this application. So all of those stages should be verified by the audit to show what is the state of the, secu of the security mm, of your application. The audits are extremely important. They are really nice uh, tool because you get the, the report uh, with list of all the problems that you have that have been this, uh, that have been found during the audit. But the audit itself also has some issues. So the first issue, and probably the most important one, is the fact that audit doesn't guarantee anything. It, it's just an attempt of finding out if there are some security issues, but only at the given point in time. So what does it mean? When you have the auditors, they have to check the specific version of the application. There's a specific commit that has been built. So what happened when we pick the version, when we deploy it and we say, OK, auditors, you can do whatever you want with that. And then your colleague from the desk next to you will just push another change to the system. Will it be audited? No. Maybe he already introduced some security issues. We don't know that. So the audit verifies the specific point in time. And also, it cannot prove that the application is free from security vulnerabilities. It can only prove that it, have, it has some 
vulnerabilities, but not that it doesn't have. So this is very similar to the uh, to writing tests. And it is also a time-consuming process. So the audit doesn't take minutes, doesn't take hours, it takes days. And for that process, you need the specialists, you need the hackers, you need the people with very special skills for a few days. So it has to cost. And it is also a bit burdensome from, from, for the organization because you probably won't invite the people from external like, uh, company and give them access to the production, to your source code and say, okay, do your job, we will wait. No, it doesn't look like that. You have to organize it something, uh, in some way. You probably have to uh, invite one of your employees or more and say that they will be a kind of guardian angel. So they, th those people have to make sure that the auditors have all of the things that they need, but in a secure way, secure from, uh, from the perspective of your organization. And uh, another issue is that without the auditors, making a good audit is really hard. And it's really hard to automate this process, but it's still extremely important. And one misconception about the audits and also some security certifications that some companies uh, have is the sentence that I heard a lot of times. We have to fix it before the audit. We don't want the audit to, to find it out. We have to fix it before the audit. You should not fix the things because of something. You should not fix the things for somebody. You should fix them before they're, because they are broken. So it's exactly the same as with the code, with all the bugs that you have. So the question and also the topic of today's presentation is what do you could what you could do in your project to improve the situation? So you probably won't hire the team of pen testers. You probably won't have just the dedicated people that will do the audits all the time. But you could improve something. You could make your situation better. And how could you do that? So my suggestion is you should pick the right tools and do it yourself. So integrate them with the process that you already have, with all the checks, all the quality standards that your project is already following. And right now I want to cover some parts of the, of the audit. So only so, some parts of, uh, of the onion that I presented, starting from the dependencies. So what could be wrong with dependencies? So the question is, how many of you know exactly what dependencies are you using in your project? And what version of dependencies do you have? There are some people, yay, good job. And do you know why do you have those dependencies for? All of them. Nice, nice, really nice. But not all the people have this knowledge. And this could be risky because when you have the dependency, you have to trust that it's secure. But it's, it could be secure at the moment when you include this, but maybe the dependency become outdated. There are some known security vulnerabilities. Also, you could have some very old dependencies like skeletons. You don't even know that they are still available at Maven Central, but they are in your project. The project compiles, so nobody asking questions. But you are still missing the, the landscape of the dependencies. So this, no, this knowledge that, uh, uh, that you should have about your project. And another thing that I won't be uh, getting into the details today is the licensing. So not all of the dependencies that are available online are allowed to be used in a commercial closed source project. But the question is, how many of you check the license of your dependencies? 
This also could be checked, this should be checked, but I'm not a lawyer, I will try to focus on the technical stuff right now. So, the first idea that you could use to find out if you have some outdated dependencies, it's already built into your build tool. So, in the Maven, you could use the Maven versions plugin. There is a nice goal called the display dependencies updates, and it will check all of the available versions against all of the dependencies that you have in your project and show that there are some updates, if they are. So, uh, please take a look here. So, we see that there was a Lombok in the version 1.16 and now there is 1.18. Yeah, that looks like a candidate for an upgrade, but one line before we have the Hazelcast, we had the version 3.9 and now there's suggestion Please pick 3.11 beta. For logback, we have the suggestion for alpha version. So the, the solution itself is not perfect. You can find in the internet how to implement using some re regular expressions, uh, the filtering, like I don't want alphas, I don't want betas, but it's still not the best one. But it's a nice tool for a beginning just to find out if there is something that could be upgraded. But uh, a lot more interesting stuff starts here. So there is another tool called the OWASP dependency check. And this one is not only for Java, but I will uh, focus today on the, on the Java part. And this tool is designed to check your dependencies against the known security vulnerabilities. So it uses the NVD database. So it's the national vulnerability database uh, maintained by the US government. And this database stores a list of, uh, of, uh, of the vulnerabilities with the specific versions of the, uh, of the libraries. So you can easily find out what is wrong with the version of the software that you have. Uh, what is really nice, you could integrate it with your build time, you can integrate it with the Sona cube, but it's pretty hard to automate it completely uh, because there are some false positives, and I will show it uh, also to you. Uh, you can find more details here on the GitHub of this project. And right now, I want to make a first hands-on session today. So I will quickly show you how this tool could be used. And for that purpose, we have to have an application. And today, I want to work a bit with the WebGoat. So WebGoat is a project also from, from the OWASP. And WebGoat is an application designed to be insecure. So it is it has completely wrong implementation of all of the things from the security perspective that could go wrong. So it's like materialization of Murphy's Law. And I've picked this uh, application from, from the GitHub and applied uh, some checks to it. So, uh, I have added the dependency check for Maven, just like a regular dependency, and then uh, make an analysis of the WebGoat. So, I've picked not the recent one uh, version, so not the WebGoat 8.0, but the previous one 7.0 to make sure that there are some outdated dependencies. And then I run the check. So, I won't be running it right now because it will take some time, uh, and it has to first uh, update the, the signatures database, uh, and we probably don't have time for that today. But what can I show you? This is the one-liner that is needed for generating the report. And we can now check the report itself. So the report is generated in the target directory as an HTML file. And you can, you can see easily here, maybe I will increase the font a little bit. Is it okay right now? Great. So here you have the, uh, the list of dependencies and also the transitive dependencies. So the dependencies of your dependencies uh, that has been found, uh, that have been found. And uh, for those of them where there is a known security vulnerability, they are, there is an uh, entry here. 
So, for example, we have a Tomcat and a version 8.5. And uh, there is a high severity vulnerability. We can jump into the link that is here, and it will uh, go directly to this to the NVD uh, uh, page. And here you can find exactly what is wrong. So here is the the number CVE is, is the standard for numbers uh, that are identifiers for all those. Uh, all those vulnerabilities, and there is always a summary. So, what is wrong? Why is wrong? And what versions are affected? So, basically, what you have to do after running this uh, analysis is to go through all of those uh, things and decide if you should upgrade something or not. And why I said it is hard to automate it completely because. Sometimes there are some false positives. There are some vulnerabilities that didn't have been uh, fixed, but probably there are not a problem for you from your perspective, because maybe you are not using some features, or maybe you have to you already resolve it in in other way. But still, it's a really nice report that somebody should at least uh, take a look at. At th and this is also something that all of the auditors, so all of those those hacking companies will do with your code. So you can already uh, do it on your own. And if you could, if you want, you could also try to uh, integrate it with your with your build process with uh, with the Sonar Cube analysis. But as I said, you can expect that there will be some false positives. So somebody will still have to take care of this. All right, so let's jump into the next topic. So the static code analysis, but the security focused one. So how many of you uh, use the tool like the SonarCube already in your projects? Yeah, a few right hands, great. So we are already checking our code against uh, the code smells from the quality perspective. Why? Couldn't we do the same with the security? And why we should do that? Because it's extremely easy to do. It's pretty cheap because we already have all of those tools, all the process that is stable, and it could prevent us from what is known. So there are some vulnerabilities that are new on the market. There are some zero days, but there is also a lot of bugs that are known to be a bug, and we can prevent ourselves from them. And it's very easy to integrate it with your build process. And one tool that I, I would like to, to talk about is the Find Security Box. This is a really nice tool, completely free for use in your project. And it's um, a kind of extension to the Find Box or the Spot Box. I'm not, not sure what is right now the situation with Find Box, but the Spot Box was created as a fork of this. And this particular plugin is able to find the security code smells in your code, like the find bugs already do for, uh, for, for the code itself. So you still could integrate it with your IDE, with the Sonar Cube, with Jenkins. It's actively de uh, developed, and it's really easy to use. So what I really like about this uh, this tool is the number of vulnerabilities that is able to find out. So right now, at the moment of preparing this slide, there were uh, 128, yeah, very nice number, uh, of known vulnerability patterns uh, built into the tool. So starting from some boring stuff like SQL injection, uh, through the bad cryptography usage, uh, bad randomization, insecure configuration for, for frameworks, uh, for example, if you have the Spring Security and you disable the CORS checks, uh, this tool will show it to you. Will say, this is probably not fine. You should do something with it. Um, and there are also other stuff like accepting untrusted server params and and the things like that. So you could find some more information about this on the project website. There is a, a list with examples. Uh, of all of the things that could be found uh, by this uh, by this plugin, uh, I won't go through the list right now, but I want to just uh, just just show it to you. 
and now there is a time for a second hands-on session. So what I've done, I've picked the web goat once, one more time. So the application that is known to be insecure and integrated the find security box plugin uh, within this application to verify what could we found. So from the code, code perspective, the configuration is pretty straightforward. We added another dependencies with some basic configuration. I had to uh, make an inclusions and exclusions just because I don't didn't want to uh, include the standard find box um, code smells. I just wanted to focus only on the security stuff. And as you can see, you have to register the find sick box plugin uh, as an additional dependency, and that's it. So. What we will do right now is we'll take a look at the report that the spot box is able to, to generate. So in most cases I'm using uh, the sonar cube for that, but you could also do this from the spot box itself. It has a really nice <coughs> GUI built on top of some very famous Java library for building GUI, but let's stop here for a moment. On the left, we have all of the security vulnerabilities that, that have been found. So we can go, for example, from hard-coded passwords. That is a really fancy one. So this tool is able to figure out that there is some method that accepts some password, and you provide it directly in the code. You hard-coded the password, and you could be really surprised how many projects have hard-coded passwords in, in within the source code. And this tool is able to show it to you. SQL problems with accepting, with building queries, uh, not uh, with with the prepared statements. It's also able to do that. It will al also provide you this uh, this whole description of why this is uh, this is wrong. XXS on the server level, also exactly the same here. So we are va validating the the data. Uh, from from the header, the header could be malformed. We have to uh, check that. Uh, probably you forgot about this, but this tool could could show it to you. As I mentioned before, you could have the Spring Security, and you probably did something uh, like disabling CSRF. This is a wrong thing to do. You should have it enabled. This tool would figure it out and will show it to you. There are also another things like uh, you have uh, a spring controller, rest controller. So that means that you should take a look at what this controller does because it exposes some behavior uh, for for the world. Um, and there are also other uh, other important stuff here. We could also take a look at another. Project so uh, the web code itself has uh, also a concept of of the lessons so there are some some configurations uh, for uh, showing the the specific uh, code issue like the insecure uh, object serialization that we have here and let's find out if the spot box is able to find this this issue with the deserialization. So as you can see, there are two security bugs reported by the uh, by the tool and the first one is that. Yeah, we are reading the object from string that has been uh, encoded uh, in base64 and comes from from the request. So this is not the obvious one, but this tool is able to find it out for you. So it's it's really nice to have it. Okay. So as I mentioned in the topic of this presentation, I'd like to focus on the code, but from the Onion drawing, you probably uh, should uh, still remember that there was an infrastructure, but these days, some part of the infrastructure is built into the code. So we have this whole infrastructure as a code um, stuff, and we could ask ourselves, what about the Docker containers that we have? This is probably the most uh, most 
popular case for infrastructure uh, within our code base. So what could be wrong with our Docker images? So probably you have a Docker file in your repository, maybe more than one. And the Docker file itself could have to use some, some base image. And this base image may be outdated. Or it could be even worse. It may be your image that you built some time ago and you forgot to update it. Or, or nobody have ever updated this image. And this image could have old version of operating system, um, vulnerable versions of the tools, and stuff like that. Also, your Docker container could use just the official image, but also it could be outdated. And another thing that I would, that I would like to outline right now is another kind of problem. So the heavy images, that there are some images that contain a lot of tools like CURL, like some archiver or, or stuff like that, because somebody would like to log in to the container and do stuff. This is not the way of how we should design our Docker containers. But the question is, what to do? We already do have the Docker files. We already do the stuff like that. We have probably some kind of vulnerabilities. And of course, the pen testers or the, the people from, from the audits uh, could do this for us. So they could find it out for us. But we should also try to improve the situation on a daily basis. And what Google suggested some time ago is a tool called Jib. And the Jib is really an interesting library because it enables you to dockerize your applications without writing a single Docker file line. You don't have Docker files at all. And there are a few changes to the whole process. So it starts from the base image. It doesn't use the, the Alpine base image or the Ubuntu or something like that. No, there is a project called DistroLess. And the DistroLess, as the name suggested, is not about small distribution of Linux. It's about not having the operating system at all. So you, the, the, the goal of the project is to build the base image, like for Java, but there are also um, images for Node.js and stuff like that, that contain only the binary of the tool that you need without any additional dependencies. What does it mean? There are no tools. There is no operating system. There is even uh, no bash or something like that. So you don't even uh, have a possibility to log in into that container. So that means that there is almost nothing to be hacked. Yay, success. Also, the, the jib itself will update the base image on, it, on its own. You don't have to worry about this. This will be done automatically. And as I said, no Docker file is required. You won't write Docker file. You won't write the code. So you probably won't introduce the bugs here. This is another nice thing. Um, also, uh, what is uh, really nice about this project is the fact that the JIP itself is able to build the Docker containers without the Docker daemon itself. So if you have the Dockerized Jenkins instance or the, the Jenkins node, uh, it could use uh, its, its own implementation to build the Docker image without exposing the, the Docker from the host. And it's also very easy to integrate it uh, within your, uh, your build process. And as a kind of bonus, uh, I will just outline it very quickly. Uh, it's able to manage the layers of the, uh, of the images in a lot better way. So when you're building your application, you're creating probably a single jar file, which contains all of the dependencies and also your code. But probably in most cases, you will just update your own code, not the dependencies itself. So why we are producing the new jar file each time. So what the jib does under the hood uh, is that it separates the dependencies from your code, and it's not using the jar file anymore. It's just running the Java process uh, in a manual way with defining the class path uh, entries for, for the dependencies and things like that. You can find some more details here on the project, uh, project website. And now I would like to show you only the the snippet. 
So this is all you need to dockerize your application with JIP. You are saying that you are using the plugin for the JIP, and here you have the name of the image that has to be built. That's it. No Docker file. It will be always up to date. It will use the secure base image that probably won't be hacked because there is nothing to be hacked there. And during the build process, you have to invoke, invoke one goal. So JIP build. That's it. Nothing more to do. All right. And that's mostly what I uh, wanted to show you today. So if you have any questions, this is the right time for that. Uh, you could also uh, write in me an email here. Uh, or if you have any questions uh, about the company, uh, or you are interested at working, especially in Poznan, in SII, please feel free to, to contact us. Thank you. There are no questions on Slido. Anybody from the room? Don't be shy, Ra raise your hand. So maybe I'll ask my question. Oh, there's one. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Uh, last tool which you showed us, uh, Google Jeep, it's for Java. What about other languages? Uh, Okay, that's a good because question. On today you were focused on uh, Java, and I'm interested for about uh, Python, Ruby, Go, other languages. Is it supported or not? Uh, so I know that it could be used with Maven and Gradle. Uh, so it's mostly about the Java applications itself. Uh, but uh, probably this will change, because the distro-less itself, the distro-less project, so the base image that is used, is already designed for other tools, like the Node.js uh, and stuff like that. But right now, the JIP only focuses on, on the Java applications. But uh, this project has been released as a stable one, like, two months ago. So maybe something will change, or maybe Google will create something similar for, for the other tools also. Any more questions? Uh, if you could uh, slide to the last, the last slide. Uh, yeah, this one. Uh, uh, this plugin makes a um, image uh, similar to Spring uh, using MVN install goal. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, there are a lot of libraries for building the Docker images, there are thousands of them. And almost all the projects that uh, I've worked in in the past have uh, slightly different configuration for that. And uh, with with JIP, it's still pretty uh, pretty the same. So you still have to uh, to define some goal to be uh, executed through the uh, through the build process, but it's it's the only one here. So in fact, you could also use the second one uh, because the the default one, so the default build is doesn't use the the Docker uh, in the Docker daemon that you have, but uh, there is also another goal called build Docker, and it will use the Docker daemon that you have installed locally. So this will be equivalent to other plugins. Mm -hmm. So this is isn't uh, an only stage of this uh, plugin. No, this is this is the only stage. You only have to decide what how you want to 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 build this. But in general, you could just apply this configuration that I showed, and execute this this one thing here, and that's it. So okay. Okay, also, so you probably will need to put here the name of the registry uh, to 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 push to, but nothing more than this. Uh, so it, it it is possible to uh, execute the uh, upload the image to uh, Amazon. Yeah, it should be fine because uh, the, ECR. the the Google Jib itself, and uh, this is described well in the documentation, uh, have a bit more complex configuration if you want to. So you can use the Google Container Registry, the uh, Amazon Elastic Container Registry. You can provide some authentication data. Uh, you could uh, yeah, define a lot of things here. So you could also even change the base image that is used. But it's not the something that you probably want to do in that case. OK, that's all. Thanks.
more questions? This might be a stupid question because I'm not an expert, but we've got a Kubernetes in the, in the project, and I don't I don't know if this chip uh, is supported, but by Kubernetes. Do you know anything ab about mm, that? It should be because in, in Kubernetes, what we have to have is just a Docker image yeah. that will be published somewhere. So if we have the the, uh, the Docker registry that is um, included in our Kubernetes configuration, then we will publish a new image with any tool. And the JIP is not an exception here. You will just uh, use this version for, for a deployment. So yes, it should be feasible to, to use it with, with Kubernetes too. All right. I'll talk with our DevOps guys about that. OK. Thanks. One more question? There is one more. There is one. Yeah. There is one. Uh, great presentation. Thank you. Uh, actually, I would like to r ask about uh, courses and secure coding uh, preparation, let's say. Are the developers and testers t taught in some way uh, not only to use tools but also to inter to make some interpretations of what the tools are saying or just any courses on security coding before? It's a very hard topic, in fact. Uh, I'm not aware of any good uh, good courses, but uh, there is one thing, but it's uh, focused on the cryptography itself. Uh, there is a free book called Crypto One on One, and uh, this is a really nice. Uh, oh, sorry, not this page. Did I oh? Oh, this one. So. This is a page created. Uh, this is a, the book created by a professional cryptographer, who, and he explains a lot of things, starting from the TLS uh, through some uh, some some stuff like encryption, hashing, and and things like that in a very simple way. So this is something that could be used as a kind of course, but I cannot recommend anything specific to you. I think that there is a. Um, a place on the market for for such uh, such such things, but I'm I'm not sure if they are any worth to to be recommended. So it's not like in your company you have like a security coding courses on site or any trainers. Uh, so in my previous company, I made uh, with a colleague something uh, similar to this, but uh, yeah, probably we should also integrate. Uh, Okay, so you're just like a special so one. Thank you for the idea. <laughs> Any more? Thank you very much. A big round of applause. Thank you.